There's, as I said, there's two parts to this talk. In the abstract, I mentioned um, three things. Um, one was HPX, which is a runtime system for high performance computing. We'll get to what that means a little later. The second is Octopus, which is um, an application framework aimed at CFD problems. Um, and the third is this idea of policies. And that's kind of the second half of the talk, and the other two parts are kind of covered in the introductory first half. Uh, I got about 60 slides here, given the size of the room. We may go a little short, in which case I have some other slide decks, and we can kind of take a group vote as to what you guys want to hear about. Um, oh, yeah, so that's, that's, is this laser pointer? Or, yeah, there we go. Cool, it's a green one. So I'm Bryce. Um, I work there at CCT, which is a research center at Louisiana State University. And I'm part of this group, the Stellar Group. Uh, whoops, there we go. All right, so we developed this thing called HPX. And our, this year's tagline is uh, a general purpose C++ runtime system for applications of any scale. I think the first thing to explain about HPX is to clarify what we mean by runtime system. So runtime system means that it's more than just a library. It's something that is managing part of your application. You should think of the phrase runtime system as meaning that we are telling you that we are going to be a little bit more intrusive into your application in the name of performance. Specifically, a runtime system has some number of runtime services that it's running within the process that is your application. So, one of the key features of HPX is that we provide a standards compliant implementation of the C++11 concurrency and threading libraries. Um, I used to remember specifically the section numbers that we implement correctly. Um, I'd have to go get my colleague to figure those out. But basically, it's the thread header, the future header, all of that stuff. And the difference between our implementation and, say, GCC's implementation or even Windows implementation is that we are targeted at supporting very, very, very fine-grained threads. And we're going to get to how fine-grained in a few slides. So we also implement a number of proposals that are in the works. Um, the dot then proposal and the win all proposal, which are both extensions to the future API to support continuation style programming. We also implement and uh, are currently doing some very cool stuff with executors. Specifically, right now, our scheduler interface. So, if you wanted to write a schedule, a new scheduler for HPX, you would use some internal API that we came up with. It's, it's pretty, you know, decent, but um, what we want to do is we want to instead change that API so that it's just the, ske the executor API, so that if you wanted to write a new HPX scheduler, you'd just write an executor. We also have this thing called Dataflow. Um, Dataflow works exactly like winall.then except that if you write data flow instead of win all dot then, we can do more to optimize your code. Um, there's actually a lot more to it than that, but you should think of it as being equivalent to win all dot then. And if you're not familiar with the concept of win all dot then, don't worry, we're going we're gonna to get there. All right. The other big thing that we do is we extend all these interfaces for remote operations. And this is our main selling point. I think I got a chart there. Yes, there we do. This is actually the same chart that I used two years ago in an HPX talk before we, um, I think that was prior to, yeah, that must have been the first one. It could have been three years ago because I think the C++11 standard had just come out. So anyways, over here, this is uh, C++03 syntax for calling a function. You've got, it's synchronous, it returns some value r, and it's a direct call. Um, actually, I think that 
chart may be incorrect because really it's that line should be down there because you've also got this lazy syntax. And by lazy, we mean something that's functional with a binder. Is anybody here not at least somewhat familiar with the idea of a binder? Okay, good. So then C11 adds these async um, functions, which are a main part of the future API. And what async does is it says, I want to do this, I want to call this function but I don't want to wait for it to finish. I want you to go and figure out where to put it and I'll give you some information. Maybe I'll tell you a launch policy. But then I want you to give me a future. And a future is just something that represents a single value that's going to be available at some point in the future. A future is a channel that has one value in my book. I'm kind of in the same camp as Bartouche. Um, in that I think there's something to be said for applying some of these monadic concepts from Haskell to futures. And we're going to get to that in a couple slides. So then what HPX does is everything in this little L shape down here. So first of all, it's important to kind of understand this concept of a JID. So a JID is basically a Another, it's part of this new addressing system that we have, which adds another layer of virtual memory. Specifically, it's a 128-bit address space, which is sufficiently large that it can span all of the nodes in any cluster that you're going to have for a while. Um, I'd have to sit down and do the math, but it's a fairly large address space. We have a service, one of our runtime services, called AGAS, which is responsible for doing all the stuff that you would expect a virtual memory system to do. Uh, address resolution, caching, et cetera, et cetera. So the purpose of a JID is that when you want to be able to invoke a remote action, you need to know what's the thing that you're going to work on. And a JID allows you to work with something that's system agnostic, that's network agnostic. It's just like a pointer. Just a really large pointer and you can't dereference it or do any pointer hacks with it. And that's what a JIT is. So all of these remote um, APIs here and the ones that say action are the remote ones. These are all representing um, how you would call something if you want to do it on another node. Now, we use the word action here because we are a pure library solution, which means that we have to do some amount of hackery to be able to actually send a function call over the wire. Um, now, this is actually not that bad. Basically, it just means that you have to use one macro, and then that macro generates a type. And then instead of passing the function to async, you pass the type. And in fact, the type acts just like a function object, so you can call it synchronously. Um, and what it does in the background is it just generates um, the relevant code to be able to turn that function call into a message that's going to be sent over the wire. And then we have over here this apply syntax, which is for fire and forget semantics. So that's when you don't want to synchronize at all with the thing that you're about to do. This is a fairly low-level interface. And there's a number of use cases for it, but for the most part, they are the sort of stuff you'd expect to see in a framework. For example, we use it during startup when we need to be able to um, send a message to the head guy who's doing the bootstrap of the system to tell them, hey, we need some JIDs so that we can create some futures so that we can talk to you. All right. So, I haven't included this HPX architecture diagram that we normally put in here because I think it's maybe not the most descriptive for this talk. Um, instead, I'm going to kind of just list out things. I may pull it up a little bit later. But the core um, part of HPX is the threading layer, and we kind of start building everything up on top of that. And it's an MN threading system. Um, that's just kind of a classification. What it means is that it runs entirely in user space, it is cooperative, and 
It tries as hard as possible to never give control back to the operating system scheduler. And the N part here is the concept that we've got N operating system threads that are acting as schedulers within our runtime. And then we've got M user level threads and they're being executed by these N OS threads. And again, it's completely cooperative, so these M user level threads only suspend if they choose to do so. We will never time slice them. As it turns out, that's very important because suspension is very bad. Waiting is just bad in general in HPX or parallel code. You never want to wait. Okay, so HPX thread quantity is basically only limited by available memory. Um, we can run with billions of threads live on a fairly small system. Uh, we're able to accomplish this because it, it's, it's not, don't, I don't want to give the impression that we've got um, billions of stacks live at the same time, but the design of our threading system can give you that impression while behind the scenes it's actually being a lot more efficient than that. So we also have very, very low overheads um, for creation, um, recycling, and all the other operations involved with every thread. So we call those per task overheads and my job for the last year has been to shave as many nanoseconds off of those as possible. Um, and I'm about 100 nanoseconds um, from where I think I can be. So maybe next year I'll get there and that would make me very happy. So AGAS is this global address space and one of the important properties that's again relevant for this talk is this concept of referential integrity. What referential integrity means is that AGAS guarantees that if you've got some object, some, something that's got an ID that you can call remote actions on, um, if you've got such an object and you want to move it from one node to another, we guarantee that the reference, the JID, will not be invalidated at any point during that process and any messages that you send at any point during that migration will be correctly routed to the destination and there will be no errors. What were the, the JID, can you explain what, what gets assigned to JID? Okay, that's... Sorry, that's, that's actually a very good question. So, AGAS is a typed um, virtual memory system. Every object in AGAS is... Oh, I'm supposed to repeat the question. <laughs> I should know these things. <laughs> the question was, what gets assigned to JID? Um, so the things that get assigned to JIDs are called components. A component is to a class what an action is to a function. Specifically, a component is some type def generated by some macro that has magic behind the scenes that allows us to serialize it and to serialize methods from it. So applications that specifically say this is a component and they have to have specifically implemented certain functions in their class for it to fulfill the concept of a component. And then every instance of that class is something that has a JIT. And those are the only things that have JIDs and in fact those are the only things that have um, you know global names. So pretty much everything in our virtual memory is um, typed. I hope that sufficiently answers the question. Um, that was a good one. Um, so components have JIDs. Components can be migrated. And if you migrate components, you can continue to address them and to send actions to them throughout the entire migration process. So I should comment briefly as to the concept of actions. There's a notion of a component action which maps to a member function. And for every component action, you have to have some macro as well. Um, little implementation details, but that's what has to be done because, again, we are a pure library solution. So we've also got this communication layer. It's called the parcel subsystem. We only have one type of message. It's called the parcel. And it has one thing that's contained in it. And that thing is an action or a component action. And every parcel, upon getting received to the correct location, gets converted into an HPX thread. So 
we are a very message-driven system. You can't send pure data. If you want to send data, you have to send it as a bound argument to uh, a function. So I should, I should clarify that really a parcel is more of a function call than a function. It represents something that's, that's been bound. All right, we've also got this uh, performance counter framework, which will become more relevant towards the end of the talk. But basically, is anybody here familiar with Windows performance counters? Nope. A little bit? OK. A little bit? All right, so, so my boss is a Windows developer. Um, he is the, he's the best guy. He writes the best Linux code of anybody I know, and he is a w Windows developer. Um, so we use a intrinsic um, little in-house framework for doing performance introspection. And it's very similar to what Windows does. Specifically, um, we have these objects called performance counters. Each one represents a single valued piece of performance data. Um, and in fact, all of them are integer. It's all integer data, so they're all of a uniform type. And then we have some types of derived counters that are based upon those base counters. And all of these counters have metadata that describes what they are, where they came from, et cetera. And the entire framework is lazy, which means that you don't pay for any of the performance counters until you instantiate any of them. We've got, we probably have somewhere in the range of, I want to say, 35 to 50 base counters that are inside of HPX. It's a hard number to count because there's a lot of derived counters. Um, once you add in all of the derived counters and once you add in all of the, we use the Poppy performance monitoring framework and we pull counters from hardware f through Poppy. So all in all, if you go and do HPX dash dash list counter, which gives you all the counters, you'll get a list of somewhere between 200 and 300 or 400, depending on your platform. And all of them have a sort of hierarchical name, so that if you want to get a counter on a specific machine or on a specific core, it's very clear how to do this. Unfortunately, I don't have an example of the naming scheme there, but I can pull one up later if we have time. So this is sort of the HPX programming model. Um, we are all about asynchrony, and pretty much everything that we're doing in, in HPX is intended to make it easier for people to write asynchronous code and to encourage them to do so both consciously and unconsciously. The core idea behind asynchrony is that if you try to avoid latencies, um, you're going to eventually hit up against physics, which are going to be something of a limitation. There's only so, you, you can, data can only travel so fast. Anybody who's writing latency avoidance algorithms, those are good and all, but you need to combine them with latency hiding as well. And you also need to be able to hide contention resolution. And especially, this becomes a problem when you've got um, limiting factors that are not from hardware, but are maybe from your algorithm. Um, as we'll talk about later, there's one really annoying part of the physics that I work on that I can't get rid of and imposes a very nasty implicit global barrier every time step. And that's very, very annoying for me. All right, so fine-grained parallelism, we've talked about that a little bit. And this last one here, local dependency-driven synchronization. We call these LCOs, lightweight control objects. Um, it includes all the traditional stuff like a mutex, a spin lock, a condition variable. You should never use those in HPX. I mean, we have them. They're there. We don't actually use any of them because it's, it's generally a performance hit. Um, the ones that should be used are futures and data flow. And we put future into the category of um, proxied or futured values in data flow and when all and dot then kind of fall more into a constraint based um, category. The final one here is um, just kind of a tagline that's again a little bit relevant to what we'll talk about and especially to the next few slides. And it's this idea that we want to send work to data instead of sending data to work. 
and one of the my, one of my motivations behind um, giving this sort of talk is the fact that this is not always an easy thing to determine which should be done because certainly if you've only got a, if you're talking about a small amount of data you don't want to send it you know you don't want to send a, a huge work amount of work to it and there's something of a challenge in determining which stuff should be migrated where okay slow so this is our performance model um, there's actually an E and an R as well I've been told they're new um, but I'm going to just talk about slow for now because the E and the R are related to energy and resilience um, which not that they're irrelevant but just that I think we can focus on these for now so uh, I conjecture that pretty much every overhead can be broken down into one of these categories um, a couple of them it's kind of unclear as to which category they'd go into but one technique we've found very useful is to analytically look at what would we would expect the limiting behavior to be of each one of these um, these four for a particular application and we found that that often gives us insight so first of all we have starvation which is inefficiency because you don't have enough work available so you've got some core and it's spinning wasting cycles and this is something that you encounter in AMR problems very frequently where you have to be constantly changing and evolving um, your hierarchy of meshes and also this is something that happens in you know my, my big beef is in advection schemes where we've got you know a CFL condition that we have to satisfy which imposes in the case where we don't have some you know linear constant velocity of propagation then we have to go and check well what's the speed here what's the speed here what's the speed here which one's you know gonna be the highest and nobody can go faster than that and it's a problem we also got latencies um, these are mostly you know hardware stuff you know pipeline stalls um, cache misses just memory access in general and overheads there's kind of two different classes here you've got your serial overheads and your parallel overheads and parallel the parallel overheads is really mostly what we're talking about in this context and that's just the costs that we wouldn't have in the serial code and the final one is um, and we had to do wordplay here just because we didn't want it to be slock so it's <laughs> waiting for contention resolution um, and that's delays because you've got some shared resource that's over uh, subscribed and I want to comment on another um, thing that's not on this slide but it's a notion of performance that's somewhat relevant we like to think about performance in terms of um, how much output do we get per time so flops is one way of looking at performance that everybody's familiar with in the context of the astrophysicists who I work with it's you know binary orbits per day um, it could be I don't know what's you you have must have something that's not flops that's a oh. performance metric um, in, in bioinformatics we have the uh, uh, billion of bases matching per right second. there the, the the response was billion of bases matching per, per second so the, the key thing to me about all those is that they fit my definition which is that it's an output divided by time so then we break that down a little bit further into two things um, one of which we call efficiency which is what the performance is that we see versus what the performance is that we should be able to get on paper and then we've also got um, scaling which is the performance that we get on n cores versus the performance that we get on one core the important part of this is that if you just look at scaling or you just look at efficiency it does not really tell you much you have to look at both because it's very easy to scale up an inefficient code and likewise if you've got a code that's very efficient it might not scale at all okay that's it for performance okay here we go this is the first fun slide so I have to say when I went through this slide I ran into an issue which was how to number all of these different events because some of them were hap happening concurrently and the first time I tried to do it by having like 4a and 4b and 5a and 5b and then I tried to read the slide and it was not an easy process but um, 
it's color coded and that's going to help a little bit. So we're going to start over on the right and just kind of ignore the code for now. This is the model for using futures that we used to think was good. Um, it's, it's a poll model. So we've got some guy executing on one node and it needs to do something. It needs to call an action called G on a component called X. That component happens to live over in node 2. Node 1 doesn't know where component X lives in node 1 and this function F does not care. It is the runtime's job to care. So it says, hey, I need you to do this thing asynchronously for me. And if it wanted to do it synchronously, you could call it. You could just do x colon colon. You'd have to instantiate that as an action, but you could call it synchronously just like a function object. So anyways, we're going to call it asynchronously. We're going to need this value at some point in the future, so we're going to have some future v. And we're going to place the call around here-ish. And so now this little dotted box is the lifetime of the future. So then we're going to go ahead and do other stuff, continue computations. One of the things we try to emphasize is create your futures as early as possible. It gives us more time to work with. As soon as you know that you're going to need a computation, create the future. Even if maybe you have to cancel it later, create it. We have plenty of cycles. It's, the hardware is available. So then the, the runtime is going to look up the global identifier. If it's local, it's going to call it. And it's not going to call it in a dumb way if it's local. It will not do a full address resolution. It can normally go through a cache and it can be not as quick as say just a direct call of a, um, a member function, but it's going to be not um, drastically slower, I would say. And then finally we get over here and now we start execution. This little red thing is a thread and this, I guess I should have explained these little squiggly lines are threads, threads of execution. So this little red thread over here, this is the call of x.g. So while this is happening at 0.5, um, over here f is doing all these computations that don't need v. And then at some point, maybe after the execution of this, maybe before, maybe at around the same time, but at some point it's going to decide, hey, I'm, you know, I need this value. I've done everything I can possibly do. And now I want to do this. And so what happens is, in this case right here, this is the case where the value is not ready yet. If it was ready, then execution would never yield. But since it's not ready, we say, OK, scheduler, you can go ahead and do something else. And that's this kind of bluish thread. So then eventually, at some point, over here, this gets finished up, and the value gets sent back. And now the future v has been set to be ready. And then this guy gets resumed. So anybody who's done any amount of programming with the C++ threading library is probably familiar with this. Um, but the problem is, there's a number of problems with this. The biggest problem is that we call .get. I've spent most of the past six to eight months trying to figure out what makes our threads slow. As it turns out, there's only one thing that really makes our threading system slow, and that's suspending threads. Because when you suspend threads, we can't reuse their contexts. The greatest thing about dependency-driven execution is that it reduces the number of times when your threads have to suspend. That instead, you have stuff that comes in, and you have less suspensions. And that's the, really the novel thing here. The problem here is that we've got a suspension that we have to yield. And the fact that we have to yield here means that the scheduler has to store our context and cannot reuse it. OK, so this is um, an example. And I realize now that perhaps this was not the simplest of examples to use, um, especially because I don't have a diagram of an oct tree here. But so this is a reduce operation that would run in parallel and distributed on an oct tree data structure, an oct tree data structure being just a tree with eight children. So with this pull model, what we'd do is we'd create some vector of futures. And uh, I've, I've put, I haven't put in the STD result of here because it's long and nasty and unpleasant and I, it wouldn't have fit on the slide. But just assume that this little um, comment here indicates the result of this here. I also didn't want to use the decal valve syntax because I think that's ugly. Um, so anyways, we create a vector features. 
that t should probably yeah, that's that t is the return type. And we go ahead and we call this same function on all of our children. And so this is gonna, you know, recurse onto whatever the depth of the tree is. And then we're gonna do some local work because nobody's called this function on our, our own node. And of course, if this is a leaf node, then this loop will just, you know, be ignored. Um, well, the loop will actually happen because it's an STD array, but there will be nothing in the vector except for this guy. And then we're gonna call this reduce function down here after we've gotten all the values out of this future. And again, we've called dot get. We don't really wanna do that. So this brings us to the next version of futures, the kind of continuation coroutine style. And this is currently what is represented in the proposals by when all and dot then, um, most of which are coming out of Microsoft. Again, we have a lot of Microsoft influences because they actually, ironically, are probably the people who are best equipped to understand what needs to be done at Exascale. Um, it's a weird thing for me to say. Anyways, this function over here is a little bit less intuitive, so I'm gonna start over here. So again, we're gonna call an async. And again, we're gonna do the computations that you know, we can do. But then instead of waiting, we're going to wrap up whatever we previously would have had inside of f, we're gonna put it into some other function. In this case, I've used a lambda because it's a more natural transformation, I think, because um, we haven't actually moved this out of the code. Now there's this thing here called unwrapped. That's a, an HPX utility um, which just simplifies this code because normally when you call that then, that then gives you a future. And what unwrapped does is it unwraps it and gives you just the, the value. For me this is important because I need future free interfaces because sometimes I have to call Fortran stuff as you know my callback function, et cetera, et cetera, and I don't wanna have to deal with futures, I want to be able to have APIs that I can expose to my users where it's asynchronous, but they're not thinking about futures. And they don't even see the word HPX anywhere in there. If you're, if you're using Octopus, the AMR framework we're going to talk about, I don't think there's a single place in the code from the user viewpoint where you would know that you're using HPX. So anyways, let's go back over here. And I've highlighted in red all the stuff that's different from before. So the first one is over here when we go ahead and create this future V, we're attaching a continuation. And uh, every future in HPX has a little list of continuations. And then everything else is pretty much the same until we get to step six. And so at step six, instead of suspending, we terminate, which is exactly what I want. Um, because again, I want that stack back. If you're not using it, don't just go sleep, give it back to me and send off a continuation, please. So the only other different thing is that when this value gets sent back, then we have this continuation that gets created in a new HPX thread. So what we've traded off is we've exchanged a suspension for the creation of a new HPX thread. As it turns out, I'd really rather have the new HPX thread because the suspension is more expensive than creating the new HPX thread. And in fact, you know, who knows, I may actually end up reusing that stack from this guy over here. So there's one issue with this that my notes tell me I should mention, um, which is, this is nice and all, but sometimes you might want this continuation to happen over on this node, because you may, it may be that that continuation you know, has a lot of data with it, it's big, it's expensive, um, and you just don't wanna have to send, send this back. Sometimes it makes more sense to keep this value over here. Well, that's a little bit tricky to do with the first future model, and it's a little bit tricky to do with this one. Um, and the only good way to do it, we'll get to in a slide or two, maybe. Can't remember if I put that in. So this is with the future push model. And this is, I think, more readable than the previous code because we're using the win all at the end stage. So again, we create some vector of futures. We go and recursively call ourselves the same function. Again, we're gonna go and invoke, invoke the function on ourselves. 
Now we're going to do this for the future because it makes it a little bit shorter code-wise, but you could, um, you, could, you could handle this in a number of ways such that um, the continuation gets both the single value here and the vector of values here. You could say that your reduce function has two arguments, one that's the single value, one that's the vector, and you could use unwrap and it'll give them to you as non-futurized arguments. Disclaimer, there's some complications with unwrapped and vectors and multiple arguments, but we're going to fix that. Um, you could also have a lambda here, and you could copy in the value of this computation that you've done locally. Again, I thought that was not the best representation here. It makes it a little more, you know, lambda-y, there's more code. But so this is, this is a nice operation. And the only issue is it's returning a future, which is a little tricky if you want to have a future-free API. But this is the way to go. This is the more optimal code path. The only issue with, th with this is, in this particular example, ensuring that you have some mechanism for trying to unwrap all of these futures because you don't want to have some nasty you know, tail recursion. For m my particular case, it doesn't really matter because the tree is not super deep. Okay, so this is the same code. The only difference is instead of having win all, we've got the data flow. So I'm going to go between these two a couple times just so that everybody's a little bit cool with this. What is data flow? Data flow is the same thing as this. Data flow is equivalent to saying win all dot then. Data flow is a statement saying when all of these futures are ready, then please start execution of this function. The difference is, here this is the function that we want to happen when all of these things are ready, and they just switch places. The reason to use data flow instead of win all is that data flow gives the implementation more room to optimize. Because here, we're not getting all the information up front. Um, we're creating the future, and then we're attaching the continuation. Here, we know immediately, hey, this is, you know, we have all, everything we need there. It's mostly just a syntax thing. Um, this is also, I think, a little bit nicer because you don't have the little domain-specific embedded language. Maybe if you're chaining, that's not the case. All right, so this is the fire and forget model. Um, this is one way of keeping the continuation on the other node. This is probably the only way of keeping the continuation where the data is that I can show with the limitations of the slide. Um, you'll also notice that this is much shorter code, and that's because it doesn't have any synchronization at the end. But so basically, you have this thing called apply, which is just like async, except apply. Um, that feature shouldn't be there. That should just be apply. Apply returns void. So you can ignore that feature there. There's no feature at all involved here. But basically, we this guy just goes, runs to completion, terminates, and then doesn't care anymore. And over here, after this is finished execution, the continuation will be called. And in fact, the continuation will probably be called within the same thread. So that you won't have, you'll have one less network turnaround, you won't have created um, another thing. And if you can write your code like this, it's nice. As it turns out, it's very difficult to do this because you do generally want to have um, synchronization of some sort. So now I'm going to show you a very tricky to use function. This is a transform instead of reduce because you can't really get the result back. But so we've got some kernel we want to apply to everybody in our tree. So we just do that should be apply, not async. Sorry, I added these two slides last. So this would just be apply, you wouldn't have any future here, and just returns void, you invoke it on yourself. And the problem, of course, is, well, how do you know when it's done? And basically, you can only really use this if you've got some sort of synchronization that's built into your class, or if you just really don't need to know when it's done. And there are cases when you don't. For example, if, you're, um, if you have a variable that all you're going to do is atomically add to it, then this is perfectly fine. So like, let's say you wanted to increase that every one of these nodes had a variable data member that represented the time step that they were currently on. You don't need to know when that's done per se, if you've got other 
sort of time step boundaries. It's an atomic operation. If you've got nothing else that's going to require you to synchronize, it doesn't matter if you know the next iteration calls the increment at the same time. Okay. Um, this is the performance sw slide, which my boss would mandate that me I put in here. Also, we're kind of happy with it. So we have very good performance um, in the local case. We are not as fast as something like Silk++, which is a compiler-based solution. Um, but we are at least as fast as any of the other library-based solutions. Um, so this is our test system, is a 2.5 gigahertz Ivy Bridge system. So about 30 uh, nanoseconds for context switch, um, which is pretty good. And the uncertainty is a little bit odd, you might think. Um, there's kind of two peaks to the distribution. We've noticed this across multiple systems. But it's a fairly low number, especially in contrast to what you'd get on an operating system context switch. So on this particular platform, it's about 500 nanoseconds total overhead um, per thread. This number does not really change for the benchmark that we use to determine this when we increase or decrease the um, length of the artificial payload that we put in there or as we increase or decrease the number of threads. So one particular example is on this system we can run with 800 million HPX threads live and that uses up about 95% of the system memory and that's all just for keeping everything in the queues. And we'll only actually have about two to 4,000 contexts that are live because the particular problem does not require a large number of suspensions for our sort of benchmark, yeah. When you say on the system, you mean on the total of the 20 cores? Yes, I mean, I mean yeah, total. The question was, was whether I mean per core or, 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 overall. or overall, yes. So 800 million threads divided by 20 right. per core. Yes. Um, the, you should, it's better to think of it in terms of, per, of memory because it's um, almost purely limited by memory. Um, so the density is about, I want to say it's 8 point, uh, I think it's 8.3 million threads per gigabyte of memory is the density. The interesting thing is that if you run with about 5 million HPX threads um, total, you get the same overheads. And that's using a substantially less system memory. Um, if you go up and if you actually overcommit system memory, yes, then you, you know, start to see the overheads become less uh, nice. But we've looked pretty rigorous, rigorously at where the pathological behavior is, and we've tried to reduce that. And for the most part, you can use any size workload for HPX threads and you can use as many as you want within the limitations of system memory, the only real limiting factor is how frequently you're going to suspend. If you suspend more, if you have a lot more contexts that need to be alive, well that's, that's troubling and will increase your overheads and it will increase them non-linearly. Yeah? How does this compare, uh, maybe off your, to using, just using p-threads, using your p-thread AP? Um, P-threads would measure their overheads in the milliseconds. So I think it would be a couple orders of magnitude. In fact, I will, um, I will go ahead and pull up briefly something, if I can find it. Uh, oh, you know what? I'm not going to have it on this laptop. I had benchmark results from TBB and a couple other things. I may be able to dig them up later, though, if we have time. Just model just your, the threading as a new API because everyone uses P threads. Um, that's probably something we'll see in the future, and I, I think you may have missed the first slide. We implement a fully standards compliant version of the, con of the C11 concurrency and thread library. So, in theory, you could just drop in HPX as a replacement for code that was written against the C++ standard. We actually, we actually have a standards compliance guy. He's, he's here. Um, 
So yes, I think um, that's something that's coming in the future. Um, really, the only um, thing that you'd need to do there is that you may want to disable our networking layer in that case. But other than that, pretty much all the other components of our system um, are either um, lazy, by which I mean they don't have any overhead if you're not using them, or they're necessary for making the thread scheduling quite fast. One other interesting thing to note here is that on the hot path, in the case where your HPX thread does not suspend, there is no locking at all throughout the entire process of creation and deletion of your thread. We can do it entirely lock-free. What this ends up meaning is that we're kind of the tortoise in the tortoise and hare situation, in that we'll have slightly slower one-core overheads, but when you scale up to 20 cores, we are competitive with everybody else, and if you look at a platform like the Xeon Phi, where we have 240 cores, um, we are orders of magnitude faster than everybody else, simply because we're able to sustain the performance um, because we're not locking anywhere. We have a lot less contention. Um, so, fairly old results. These are kind of last year, maybe nine months ago. Um, but Thomas Heller's been doing these uh, 0.35 petaflop in-body runs on Stampede. Um, I can't put it on the slides, but I can say more recently I, we've had um, results in the uh, slightly higher range. I think we're starting to get close to 0.5 petaflops running on the same system. And we're also looking at running on some blue gene Q systems over in Germany. Um, what I mean by that, uh, please repeat the question. He asked, what do I mean by short-ranged in-body simulation? Are you familiar with um, like a long-ranged in-body simulation, something that you'd use for... So um, what I mean is that this is not that it's it's only look simulation. yes i think that would pick code. yeah it's closer to a pick code the code itself um i'd have to check it is it is definitely a particle and cell code um the the defining characteristic is it's you know doesn't have the global dependencies um I'm not sure what the specific problem is that he's solving. It, it is not a complete application code. It is a, um, a I, I don't want to say test problem, um, but it's not like it's integrated with some physics package right now. Um, is that sufficient answer-wise? A little pick code is sufficient <laughs> answer. Okay, how am I doing for time? You have... Okay, wow. I guess I made enough slides. All right, so this is the only really intensive code example. Um, I like this because it's 34 lines and um, it does everything I want. Specifically, I've got some sine wave, um, which is propagating to the right, and I want it to kind of reflect around my domain, which is a one-dimensional grid. And I'm going to use some very, very, very simple upwind finite differencing uh, scheme. And I want to have some asynchronous I.O. at the end. I want to print out what my result is. So there's a number of things to go through here that um, it's, a, it's a short code that does not mean that there's not a lot of complexity here. Um, let's kind of start from the top. We can kind of ignore these. Those are just parameters. A is the propagation of the wave. Um, for simplicity, the time step size and the grid spacing is assumed to be one for both, but uh, you can imagine throwing a dt divided by d dx in here. D yeah, dt divided by dx in there. Um, and we're not doing a full upwind, upwind scheme. We know that we know the direction that the wave's propagating. We know we don't have to check um, to see it, what the speed of the wave is, because it's constant. So this little for loop here is our stepper code. So each iteration is one step. But we're not actually doing any execution here. We're just building the execution tree. So we've only got this one vector of futures. So each time step, we update this vector of futures. 
and we say, hey, you can start, you know, for this is for the boundary condition, you can start computing u0 for time t when u0 for time t minus 1 and the other boundary, because we're reflect or periodic rather, um, for the other boundary, when those are ready from the last time step, then you can start comp computing. And same thing for down here, that's got one more argument than it should have. Um, that should just be, it should drop the last argument there. Minor details. Um, but the important thing is that by the time we exit this for loop, um, one, we've not waited on anything, and two, the computation's you know running, but um, because we haven't waited on anything, it's, if, if we run this in the one core case, because we haven't suspended and there's no other cores available to schedule, nothing started execution. But the entire execution tree has been built. So all we have to do is, you know, it's, it's going to start itself because the initial conditions are there. But all we just have to do is kind of wait and it's just kind of flow through whenever it's ready. So question, so <clears throat> what's the overhead of the execution tree now here. So there is not much data in the simulation. So this one is not a super efficient um, simulation, certainly. Um, the overhead of a future is, t in terms of total creation for the minimal case excluding application code, is in the range of, I think, two to three microseconds. So that's two or three thousand nanoseconds. So it's not cheap. What about memory? Um, memory is, we've got the double, we've got probably, I'd say at least 64 bytes of management stuff in the future. Um, the, the thing is though, this is not how you'd actually do it. In, in actual code, you'd you know, have ghost zones and you'd have blocks. Your futures should be a little bit more granular. Um, this is mostly for demonstrative pur demonstrative 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 purposes. I'm not good with words all the time. Um, but that is a completely valid point. This is not going to be super efficient. Um, and the other thing is that uh, because we're creating the entire execution tree up front, this is not good if you want to do more than the 45 time steps we have here. But we're going to get to a little bit later the better way of doing this. Um, I'm going to move a little bit faster now so that we can hopefully get there. Um, the next slide should be fun. There we go. Can you turn off the lights, actually? Or where are the lights? Ooh, I can. <laughs> I thought they were back there. This one's always difficult to see. I had to change the contrast. Um, completely ignore the star. Pay only attention to the grid. If you can see it. It may be a little tricky. But just look at what's happening to the grid as the material flows around it. In particular, you could really see it in the first um, few seconds. But you can still see it now, right there. We've got those regions that are popping up. And they're popping up in, the time scales here are uh, probably a couple hours computation. Well, I'd say maybe 30 minutes, an hour of computation time in between. Um, Frames. What, what, what does this do? And this is how many, how many cores? Are oh, well, I, this is probably running on uh, this particular one. This may have been one of our early MPI. This is from our binary um, driver, which is, this is from the, either the MPI or the OpenMP binary driver. I think this was probably on like 256 cores. Um, I'm going to play it again this time and now actually explain what it's doing. Um, these two guys are white dwarf stars. And uh, the one right here is a donor, which means it is more massive but less dense. Guy over here is the accretor, um, which is less massive, more dense. May have that the other way around. I'd have to go to the next slide, which I'm going to do. So the donor is is, is losing mass to the accretor. And this is in a rotating frame of reference. These guys are actually orbiting around each other. And what's going to eventually happen is 
they will, the donor will be completely destroyed um, and all of its material will be absorbed by the accretor. And now we'll talk a little bit about why this is something that's interesting. So White's dwarves are the end stage evolution of, uh, the, the most common end stage evolution of most stars. Um, they're composed of the products of, of fusion, the electron degeneracy matter. Um, most of them are carbon, uh, oxygen. They have a helium or hydrogen shell though, which ends up being important for um, what happens when the sort of merging uh, goes on. So they're about the size of Earth. They're very dense. Um, I think it's something like if you had a spoonful of a white dwarf, uh, you would not be able to lift it. It would be so dense, like even a tiny sand grain um, at the same density. So there's a lot of them, and they are the most common type of star system. Um, there's about 300 million in our galaxy. Now, over time, these systems will destroy themselves. They'll kind of pull in and um, orbit around each other, and they've got a number of different end stages. Yeah. This was actually observed. Two physicists won the Nobel Prize in physics, I think, at the University of Massachusetts, I think, in the late 70s or late 70s. Yeah. The, um, they actually they calculated the gravitational work of radiation. Yeah. Radiation that would. Um, I used to have the references in this slide. I was expecting um, a more, a less physics-friendly crowd, possibly. So I. So it's been a simulation. The last. Yeah. The last actually occurred. Yeah. No. Most of the. So I should clarify the the guys that we wor work with are the two head astrophysicists I work with are not um, computer guys. They're observational guys, um, and they'll you know we're, we're mostly. We are not really a compu uh, computation-heavy group. Um, we you do use the simulations because they need they need the data to um, you know prove some of their ideas. So this one is an unstable mass transfer, um, which means it's not going to really maintain itself for very long, and that donor is just going to be completely eaten up. Now you'll notice at the end here there's a numerical well. It's a little hard to notice, but at the end here, there's a slight numerical issue um, in that the center, the star kind of moves upwards a little bit in the z direction. This is an xy slice because the center of gravity um, changes a little bit and we don't correct for it perfectly. Um, but so this is, this is the unstable mass transfer case, which leads to one of two possibilities. Um, depending on what mass the star reaches um, after the merger. If it's below 1.4 solar masses, which is the chandra sekar limit, um, it's, it's basically the, the limit of the density um, which keeps it from collapsing, but it, it cannot um, go below that uh, mass and still maintain the density of a white dwarf. So in that case, um, they form hydrogen deficient stars. Uh, the specific type that our research group's interested in is RCB stars. Um, the other case that um, is our main focus is when they merge and the mass approaches and then goes over the Chandrasekhar limit, in which case it's um, suspected and there's observational evidence um, that this will lead to a type 1a supernova. Um, and this is interesting because these are standard candles. Type 1a supernovae are standard candles. And we'd really like to know what's happening in terms of where's all the mass right before the detonation and what is the structure of these, simul of these systems look like um, before they go nova. Um, and the reason for this is that we, that Doing these sorts of simulations will um, perhaps give us some insight uh, into the, how good of a standard candle they are. So if, there's, if they're merging and there's still a lot of mass left in the system, um, that may cause issues. Um, whereas if they've mostly completely merged and the mass is all very concentrated, 
um, and then they go supernova, it's a little bit um, stronger case. Anyways, um, now we're out of the slides that are outside of my area. I'm mostly a math and CS guy. So these are some pictures to kind of give an idea of what our domain decomposition looks like. Um, this one is, I think, a 10 level of refinement, and this one I think is a 12 level of refinement, um, which is, uh, okay, thanks, Paul. Which is, for AMR codes, pretty deep. You, the, my previous work with AMR codes, which has been with neutron star simulations, um, we would go maybe three, four, five, six, seven levels. Um, to some degree, this is a factor of, of our octree decomposition, but also it's, it's because we want to have a very large grid relative to where the stars are. This, this is kind of a more close-up. This is the entire domain. And you can see they are not, you know, most of the density is, is in the center here. And in fact, this is not even large enough for if we wanted to do the detonation physics. Right now our code does not handle the, um, the actual nu nuclear physics that um, would come into play once uh, it goes nova. So this kind of gives you an idea of the scales we're dealing with here. And these guys are rotating around each other. We use what's called a rotating frame of reference, which means we try to rotate the grid, grid with them. But as you could see, um, before, there were a lot of regions of the grid that were being re-refined or becoming unrefined. The, it was pretty frequently we were having changes in the uh, mesh structure. Um, I'm going to skip over this physics slide due to time. I am going to stay in this one, though. Um, this is um, from a particular simulation that I'm going to talk about in the next slide um, of a massless torus. And our, we were using a new advection scheme there, which is designed to conserve angular momentum on a Cartesian grid. And our goal was to, of course, try to conserve angular momentum. So the lines up here are with the Cartesian, at mom uh, Cartesian momentum conservation scheme. So just have an X, Y, and Z momenta and um, reconstruction, reconstructing angular and um, tangential momentum. Um, the angular momentum is particularly important in the case of a torus because it's a torus. It has symmetry. So here, clearly, we're not getting conservation to within truncation error. Truncation error is around there-ish. And so these are for the old traditional scheme. This is for our new hybrid scheme. And we're very happy with this. In fact, the, for the first tenth of an orbit, the truncation error is very clearly just machine noise. And uh, this is at a fairly low number of uh, amount of resolution. When we go up to like a seven level, level of re resolution run, um, we can conserve it to machine precision and we can run it in parallel and do the same. Um, and this is a slide which I find very relevant because it kind of gets into some of the tolerances that our group has, which is basically there's no tolerance for um, anything even in the name of speed that we need to be able to maintain this same level of precision um, it, when running at any scale, um, which is tricky. <laughs> So this is the actual torus, um, and this is what it looks like after three and a half orbits, and it looks this way because you're putting something that um, really belongs on a, a cylindrical grid onto a Cartesian grid, and that introduces four modes. So back here, you can't really see them, but there's four modes, one, two, three, kind of perturbations there. Um, and they show up and eventually tear this guy apart. Um, so this is all using octopus, which is um, a next uh, sort of third generation um, of a code written by my colleague Dominic Marcello. Um, and it's written with HPX. We 
use a bunch of numeric stuff that I just skipped over due to time, but um, trust me, it's not super important for you to understand. Um, but basically, we do a very simple, explicit, finite differencing scheme. Um, we don't do any super high order methods, but we use a you know high resolution scheme. And our our goal, really up until this point, has been um, using schemes and methods that are not going to make the code um, excessively complex and maintaining um, you know the conservation laws as best we can. Yeah. Two questions. One. Last year you mentioned that you had modified the serialization. Yeah. Where it only used to go just to a file and, and made it work on um, sending sending it over the wire and made it. Mm -hmm. Is that under the hood of Octopus or is that something that we So the question was regarding my talk last year about serialization um, and using it to transfer data over the wire. So that's what we use. That's that was that talk was based on the back end for HPX. So. Basically, um, we took a lot of, so that was kind of just a case study that we started doing, and we ended up integrating a lot of that back into HPX. But HPX has always used that basic idea for serialization. So, so is that available? Is that code yes, public domain? Yes, okay, that's everything in, H, everything in this talk um, and in all my talks is openly available. Um, and yes, yeah, so that's definitely there, and there's a repository specifically for the stuff from last year's so talk. Yeah, we we use yeah. Um, it's it uh, the stuff from last year's talk is in a repository, and it just depends on boost serialization. And the second is when you do the meshing, the um, finite element, uh, is that distributed over all the nodes, or are you just sort of yes? One section of the geometry is is being meshed in one node, and then we we distribute it all over all the nodes, and. Um, the great, the big problem is how to do that and how to um, maintain that distribution. Um, right now, we have two or three options. Option number one is specific to this problem, and it's just a uh, slice it up like pie, um, and that does not work very well if you go beyond four nodes because the surface area that is it, it that's exposed starts to get to be unpleasant. Um, we have a couple other methods. We have one that's based on mathematical optimization, which basically looks at um, sort of a running. It's it, basically we, we try to um, minimize uh, a cost function that we built based upon um, the workload on the node and the um, the locality of any other possible nodes that we would send it to. The trade-off is, is a question of, well, we could send it over there, but if we did that, then we would have more ghost zones that would have to be sent over the wire. And, and is it worth it to send this, ob this cube over there for load balancing? And it's a hard question to um, get right, um, especially when you have to deal with, but yeah. a specific library for that which has been developed. Yeah, um, I'm not. Have you tried that? I looked at it. The question was um, regarding libraries for load balancing um, meshes like this. I've found in general, I haven't looked at that one in particular. I've heard of it. I found in general Zoltan. Is that right? Um, it's from one of the national labs. Yeah. So the the I've. I've found that very frequently the load balancers um, are not local enough for me, that they are based upon the assumption that there's going to be some sort of stop the world, everybody talk, and then redistribute. I want something that's going to make decisions based upon as little data from other nodes as possible. The other issue, and this is more of a us issue than other people issue, is that there's special rules that we have to take into account because we're using an octree. Um, and in fact, an octree is not the best um, solution for AMR in general because it's not as efficient as block structured AMR. It is much simpler. So it's likely in the future that we will um, consider and possibly switch to a block structured um, AMR 
solution, in which case we'd probably start making use of um, a more frameworked approach for the load balancing. So what does the block structure bring? Um, well, first of all, it makes the interpolation more complicated. The question was, what does the block structure bring? It, it, you mean in terms of benefits or in terms of... What is it? Something else besides that each cell is a block of cells, actually? It j well, it just gives us more flexibility. It's more general. The octree domain forces us to use um, blocks of a certain size that are you know, we can ch chunk up into eight. And also, if we, um, these, these uh, AMR regions, some of them could be tighter than they are um, if we were doing block structured. And uh, some of them, you know, we end up, the ones that were cycling before, where we kind of saw them come back and forth and back and forth, that was really because um, there was only a very small portion of them that was actually needed to be refined. And because it's it's uh, it over it overestimates or underestimates, and so it's not perfect. And the memory tends to have issues. And the fact that we have to either use eight or sixty-four for our block size um, is kind of problematic, given that our ghost zone width um, is very deep. Specifically, we have a ghost zones of three cells. Um, for the hydro portion and four cells for the gravity solver, um, which may be in a slide or two. Let's, how am I on time? You have about 20 minutes. Huh, cool. OK, so this is kind of a breakdown of the current architecture. Um, the bottom layer is HPX. And then we've kind of got the um, general purpose stuff in Octopus. So. AMR is kind of referring to the base data structure, which is currently the octree. Um, that's the, the name octopus. I'm assuming that was a pretty obvious one, though. Uh, so that's just kind of data structure. And it's written um, sort of with a similar mindset to an STL data structure, with the exception that this one is a lot more code and happens to, you know, be a distributed data structure. But the AMR um, stuff is basically just data structures specific for AMR, but independent of solvers, of physics, of anything like that. So uh, is that available? Um, that is available. Um, I, we, we, we can, yes, that's, there's a, it's available and there's in fact a couple different generations. Um, there's, we have a sister code called Scorpio. Um, this is what happens when young people are allowed to name things. You end up with weird stuff, but we have a sister code that's an MPI code that is more suited for the FMM stuff and then Octopus has the Octree stuff. Um, but yes, those are all available. So then there's the load balancer stuff. This is currently, as I mentioned, a little bit of a weak point um, that we need to work on. Um, one of the reasons it's not come up yet is that right now we're mostly running the Taurus on Octopus and um, it's not as dynamic because it's just a spinning disk. Um, we've got IO stuff. This is actually a fairly important um, aspect because Parallel I.O. is very painful. Parallel I.O. with AMR is very tricky. Doing, adding in asynchrony makes it more complicated. And um, some of these libraries are not the easiest things to work with. HDF5. Yeah, HDF5 um, is a little tricky. And there's a problem where we have to build it specifically with a flag that enabled to make it thread safe because I guess by default, people just don't need that in HDF5. We mostly use a format called Silo, which is conspicuously missing for some reason. Um, and that's out of, I think, LLNL. And our primary visualization is um, with Visit. Um, although some of those visualizations, a couple slides back, were with a GNU plot plus Python framework that um, was developed over the course of one of my colleagues' PhD theses. theses. Um, then we've got checkpointing. This is another one which is fairly important. Um, right now we do a sort of cheap man's checkpoint, um, which means we just write it out. Um, 
we write out each checkpoint on each node and we say similarly for the IO our, our strategy is to do parallel IO but only to do it within a single node across multiple cores um, and then to combine it later the reason for that simply being that there's um, facilities within visit within all of our visualization tools for combining the data and we don't particularly see a need to tackle the full challenges of AMR IO so then in the middle tier, we've kind of got our solvers. Um, there's two things that we need for the double white dwarf simulations. Um, one is we need some way to solve a gravity equation. Um, and we used to do that with a Poisson solver. Um, and that was not fun and was very slow. It was a multi-grid method. Um, it was, you know, global time step, global boundary at every time steps and um, very expensive and not as accurate as what we're doing now which is a fast multipole method um, which still has a global time step boundary but it has much more pleasant communication patterns and it's more accurate which is a big selling point with my colleagues. Um, so then on top of that in the top tier we've kind of got a bunch of um, what we call policies um, which we're going to be the second half of this talk, but I guess I over underestimated or overestimated my speaking length. But so basically, these the stuff in the top tier is just kind of very specific physicsy stuff. So um, like this math, there's there really should be one here for Newtonian um, hydrodynamics. For you know, there should be one specifically for the um, Eulerian uh, the Euler's gas equations. Yeah. Do you have actual code uh, showing how the policy is placed into the template? Um, so the, the thing is that I have a different definition of policy than what most people do because I have to deal with runtime policies and I may, I'm going to skip drastically ahead in my slides really quickly. Um, I just have to figure out where it is. It should be right here there we go so this is what i define as a policy um, where configuration variable is this so configuration state is um, data that uh, is used by a runtime or library to control certain aspects of execution by definition, it is almost always um, something that's some sort of global data that's amorphously hidden inside the library. Um, and that by changing the configuration data, it's not just like passing a parameter to a library API call. When you change the configuration state, you're changing some aspects of the library, which to undo, you'd have to call some other API function. Um, and in HPX, we have many different levels and places in which configuration happens. So I really consider everything in this list to be part of uh, the configuration state of software. So preprocessor definitions, variables from the build system, you've got all the compile time stuff. So your traditional policies falls into the category of template specializations. Um, that's more of what Proto's doing. Um, then you've got the stuff that you would find in a C library, which would be global variables. Um, and then you've got the stuff that only I would consider to be um, a part of your application configuration, which is that I think the symbolic mapping that your linker runtime maintains is part of your configuration because I'm able to change that. Um, so this is the definition that I use. And I use this definition, and it's a configuration variable. So something that's part of your configuration state that has some amount of, of possibility to be arbitrary user code. So it's either a meta function, something that executes in the compiler, or it's a callable. Um, and then it gets used somewhere at a customization point in your code. Um, what you may be thinking of is more like uh, something like this, which is what you'd see in spirit. Now this is definitely, you know, a policy, but I also consider the function that um, defines my advection scheme and my flux and my source terms to be a policy. Um, and in fact, one of the cool features about Octopus is that, and we did this for a demo once, 
um, we can change the solver being used in the middle of the run. Um, so we had a running simulation that was at LSU and we were in Denver um, and there was an interface and you could go and press a button and switch it from the Cartesian advection scheme to the um, angular advection scheme and you could see the um, conservation of angular momentum spike up when you went from the angular to the Cartesian. Um, we have to build very adaptive frameworks um, for a number of reasons which I should have somewhere here. Uh, nope, that's too far. It should be the Y. I may not have that slide anymore. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I got plenty of interesting ones. So, um, how much time do I have, Paul? You have nine minutes. All right, so I'm going to go over this slide quickly because it is an interesting one, and then I'm going to jump back to talk a little bit about um, my, a, a little bit about the CFL condition. So, one of the, and Joel Falklu will find this amusing, um, my boss is Hartmut Kaiser, who wrote um, Boost Spirit, which is one of the more template-heavy codes in existence. And surprisingly, our runtime system, um, there's a number of places where we um, do not avoid, where we don't use templates when we could. And there's a number of places where we use um, polymorphism where some people at this conference might think that it's a bad idea or that it incurs costs that are, um, you know, prohibitive. But I'll give you one example. We have, um, we have four possible parcel handlers, five scheduling algorithms, and four queuing strategies. Um, if we wanted to make our runtime object a template, which is what, you know, would be good and nice and we wouldn't have to make it polymorphic, we could do that, and that's what currently what we do do, but we'd have at least 80 possible different instantiations, and we want to be able to, at com when we start up the runtime, we want to be able to select, you know, some combination of these policies. And I don't have a good way to dynamically to do a dispatch when I've got hundreds of possible different instantiations. And I don't even think the compiler um, could, uh, I mean, it, it, it takes long enough to compile HPX as is. I don't think I could reasonably build an if loop to handle this. So I, I find myself um, looking into, you know, what's the costs of virtual, you know, dynamic polymorphism versus static, and it's a couple of orders of magnitude difference, but virtual polymorphism, I'm talking about a best case of 16 cycles, because it's a best case of, say, two L1 um, hits. That's the best case time. Well, the one of the cheapest um, operations that gets done in the scheduler is um, scheduling a thread, which involves one um, push operation into a lock-free queue. I know that the cost of that operation is 20 nanoseconds plus or minus 4 nanoseconds on a wide range of platforms. It varies a little bit, but it's within that same order of magnitude on modern hardware. Um, 20 nanoseconds, way larger than a couple of cycles. So I'm not going to sweat a couple of cycles when pretty much any call into my runtime has to involve atomics or involve a lock. So it's interesting, but HPX does not have a lot of motivation to use um, CRTP or static polymorphism in some places because it just makes the code scarier. Um, all right, we're going to see how far we get with this other portion here. Um, okay. So um, our, we use a third order time integration, I should mention. So we've got three um, one cut of time steps for uh, every one of our, uh, every time step of this guy. Now, as I mentioned here, this is a massless torus. I don't have to worry about gravity or anything like that. I just have one gravity, or constant gravity. So when I start looking at the dependencies of this, 
well, if I've got three futures for each ghost zone, and this is a 2D example, but if I've just got, if I set up three buffers for every ghost zone, well, then I can just overlap the ghost zones. Um, I can just set up the dependencies just like I did with that simple 1D example, and I don't have to have any implicit weights. Um, there's only one problem, um, and I'm just going to quickly step through why this is something that's possibly useful. So everybody starts computing. So this guy needs to wait for those guys. It's at the boundary. So then that guy's computing and waiting for this guy here. Maybe this is on a slightly slower processor because solar radiation inserts some reason, but this guy took longer than this guy. And so now we've got a situation where, you know, this guy can continue computing. This guy needs to wait here. This guy needs to wait here. Eventually, he's going to have to wait for some data from these guys, but we want to proceed as quickly as far as we can. And so this is actually something that's beneficial even in this um, fairly simple um, torus case. So the CFL condition um, is a problem for me because it's the only thing preventing me from overlapping time steps. Um, by which I mean I have to, at the end of each time step, say, hey, I got to go compute the CFL everywhere, yada, yada, yada. It's, it's a pain. Um, so we're just going to cheat. And by cheat, I mean we're just going to predict um, what it's going to be. And, you know, in the worst case, we roll it back um, because we're going to make a conjecture that it's pretty, you know, sane. And what we do is we have a buffer, a rolling buffer, instead of that huge vector we talked about before. We just have a rolling buffer, and as the buffer it rolls over, um, that's when we do the check of the actual time step. So a typical size would be to say 10 time steps. So what that means is we go and we predict some time step size for the next 10, um, and then you only need to had that global dependency 10 times in the past, and if you make some mistake and you violate the CFL condition, oh well, we roll back the computation. So this is um, a period of a thousand time steps um, from our longest tourist run, run which was about uh, 70,000 SUs. Um, so this is a this was a thousand time steps was probably about a day's worth of computation. Um, we had this one little spike here and this one little spike here. The rest of the time it oscillated. Um, the CFL condition tends to os the if you compute your time step size based on the CFL maximum allowed time, you'll notice that in most codes it tends to oscillate a little bit because um, you're kind of overcorrecting and undercorrecting. Um, this is what it looks like for the entire run, which was, um, again, 70,000 SUs. Um, this right there was an event where we had material that was going from a coarser region into a finer region, and a bug in our AMR um, refinement rules prevented us from catching it. Um, this was the beginning here, um, which is a little bit scary, but there's all these regions in here where we've got little spikes, but we can, for this particular code, um, predict pretty well because, um, hey, that's, you know, <laughs> got pretty predictable behavior. And in fact, we can even do something smarter than that, and we have a little thing where we um, do some, some math with slopes, and there's some calculus involved. I won't bore you with the details. Um, the other thing that I really want to do, and it's good that Joel is in, in the room, um, so typically when you, ca when you, uh, Basically what I want to do is I want to unroll t to the t plus n time steps. So every time step you reconstruct your values at the faces and then you compute you know, the next time step. And um, every solver I've ever seen does it iteratively. Um, and I think that there must be some way to use something like nt2 or some um, domain specific language to say, hey, I want to do these 10 operations, and I'm not going to do my CFL, so here's some constant here, and you just unroll this operation and see if you can give me some more optimal code. So, anyways, that's my talk. I didn't actually talk at all about policies that much, but I hope you guys <laughs> enjoyed it, and if there's any questions, we're definitely out of time, but I don't think there's a session after this. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Questions? Okay, cool.